Hello. Thank you for tuning in and listening. Happy Lord's Day to you on this Sunday, February the 19th, 2023. This is the eighth lesson in the 2023 Everett Hodges Archive Series. This is a lesson from Sunday, February the 24th, 2007, and it is titled, Jesus' Unfinished Work. He had finished that which he had come to do in making known the wisdom of God, that which God had sent him to do, making known the salvation that was available to all men through him. But there is that which remains that is to be done. That was not the end of the work which was and is to be done. His work continues. And it's important that we understand that and that there is work that is yet to do. Uh, this is not the end of his work in either the physical or the spiritual realm. Uh, some is finished, some is left to be finished. When we look at the realm of nature, for instance, the work of creation is finished. That was done in six days. This, of course, was the master plan of God, and it was God who created all things. In the beginning, God created, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, but it's also true that Jesus was involved in that creation, that he was a, very much a part of that creation. In John chapter 1, verses 1 and 3, there John says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and that nothing was made apart from him, and apart from him nothing that was made was made. And so he was involved in that creation. In, Hebrew, in Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 15 to 17, Paul says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist, or all things hold together. And so we see from these, and of course others as well, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, the Hebrews writer talking about Christ, says, in whom he made the world. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14, he says that uh, the faithful and uh, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And so we see in all of those that, that Christ was a part of that creation. And that creation was finished in six days. But this great and glorious creation with great power manifest in such a great universe and its inhabitants brought into existence by nothing but his spoken word. And he could look back on that and say that it is finished or that work has been accomplished. But his work in the universe continues. In John chapter 5 and verse 17, Jesus said, My Father is working until now, and myself am also working. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17 that we just read a moment ago, he said in him all things consist or hold together. And so he holds all things together. He completed the creation, but he holds all things together. The running of the universe is under his control even until now. The running and the operation of this creation is still in his hands. God is in control of all things even to this day. And we look at the world situation, and we wonder how that can be. We, we look around, and we look at how things are in the Middle East, and how things are in other places, and we wonder how that could be. But be assured that even though it seems that uh, world leaders are in control of things, God is ultimately in control, and it all will come under his control in the end of things. We can go back to the Old Testament, I think, and see a little bit of this as we look at, at the times in the nation of Israel when they were in, became idolatrous and rebellious and all of this, and God sent prophets to speak to them, and they refused to listen. And so God raised up nations 
Gentile nations, heathen nations, to punish them. But in the end, then, he turned around and punished those heathen nations as well. He was in control of all things. Those nations controlled Israel for a time, but ultimately God stepped in and controlled those heathen nations. And so we understand that God is in control of all things. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8, the writer says, But the Son, but of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. And so as time goes on and study continues and exploration takes place, we're learning more and more of the vastness of this universe. Uh, space travel has told us a lot about this universe that we never knew before. And uh, the development of uh, giant telescopes and other things have told us a lot of things about, about this universe that we've never known before. But space travel... As important as it is, answers to a command center here on Earth. Even when they are there, when they're up there walking in space or working on equipment space or, or whatever it is, they're answering to a command center here on Earth. Maybe in Houston or maybe in, in, uh, in Florida, but they answer to a command center. And by the same token and in the same way, in a far wider and deeper sense, the Lord is the command center for the whole universe. Everything in this universe, including you and me, answer to that command center of God. Ultimately, we're going to answer to that command center of God. It's not in man that walks to direct his own steps, but we must depend upon him. And so God's work in creation is not finished. He completed the act of creation, but the work still continues. And as we look into the redemptive realm, as we get from the physical into the spiritual, he finished what he came to, on earth to do. He came teaching. He came identifying himself, finally dying for man's redemption, being raised on the third day from the dead. So we understand that when he went to the cross, that he could look back and say, it's finished. He had accomplished his purpose. He had come. He had uh, appeared before men. He had done miracles to, uh, to, to verify his, his position. He had trained men to walk in his steps, to follow him, to, to, to carry out the work that he had left for them to do. And uh, when finally the hour come, you know, several times throughout the, the uh, accounts of the gospel during his lifetime, it was said that the hour has not yet come meaning that he had not completed his purpose, that he had not accomplished what he had come to do yet, but the time will come when he must go into Jerusalem and there die for the sins of the people. And so ultimately, when he went to the cross, when, he, when the time came and Pilate washed his hands of the whole matter and he turned him over to, the, to them to be crucified and was nailed to the cross, he could look at all of that and say, it's finished, I've accomplished what I came to do. I came to, to train men, I came to, uh, to be the savior of the world, I came to provide the sacrifice that will save the world, and so on. He had accomplished all of that. But in a very real sense, the work continues. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 20, after the giving of the Great Commission on, in, in Mark's account, when he said... Uh, that uh, go and teach all nations, and he that believeth is baptized shall be saved. In Mark chapter 20, um, chapter 16 and verse 20, it says, And they went out, that is, the, the apostles went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that followed. Notice carefully, the Lord worked with them. And so even though on the cross he could look and say it's finished, his work continues. And he continues to work with those apostles. Now the book of Acts is a commentary on that passage as Christ's work continues through the apostles. In Acts chapter 9, for instance, in verse 10 and following, Ananias, when this is the story of Saul of Tarsus that we talked about this morning. And Ananias, the preacher, the Lord appeared to Ananias, the preacher, told him to go to Saul who was in the city, and to preach to him, teach him the gospel. Ananias didn't much want to do that because he had heard of Saul, knew about his reputation for, for uh, persecuting Christians and so on. But the Lord said go, and so Ananias did. And that's a, an account of the Lord working with them, the Lord going to Ananias, sending him to Saul of Tarsus, who would be the 
uh, the uh, apostle to the Gentiles. And then we move on to, to Antioch in Acts chapter 11. Uh, when uh, from Antioch, it, there is there are a couple of things that uh, took place in Antioch in, in chapter 11, uh, verses 2 and following. It says that when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying he went in, uncir went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began speaking and perceived, proceeded to explain to them in orderly sequence, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and then this is, of course, the the uh, time that he went to Cornelius and his household to the Gentiles. And to move on down to verse 20, it says, But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, Peter has already gone to the Gentiles in the household of Cornelius. But in Antioch, they had been preaching only to Jews. But then there came some men and began to preach to the Greeks as well, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed to turn turned to the Lord. And the news about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off, uh, off to Antioch. So you see, there is the Lord working with them. Those men came preaching to the Greeks, and the Lord was working with them. In chapter 13 of Acts, verses 1 and following, we read about uh, Paul and Barnabas being sent out, there were at Antioch at the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene and Manan, and who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them, for which I have called them. Thus, when they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And we have then the beginning of the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas as they went from there and Frank has done a really good job on Wednesday night of, of uh, covering the journeys of Paul and the life of Paul but here the Lord the Holy Spirit said set them apart and so the work of the Lord continues even there not only that but he spoke to Paul in Acts chapter 18 verses 19 and, uh, 9 and 10 he told Paul do not be afraid Go ahead and preach because I am with you. Acts chapter 18, verses 9 and 10, and chapter 22, verses 17 and following. After his conversion, the Lord told him what that he wanted him to do, and so the Lord's work continues through the Apostle Paul. Now, all of these occurrences in Acts are subsequent to what he said in John chapter 9 and verse 4 when he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, for the night comes when no man can work. Or in chapter 19 and verse 30 and following, where he said it is finished and he gave up his spirit. So following that, and even though he said his work was finished, he still continues to work with them in the spread of the gospel. And I believe with all of our heart that he works with us today that he continues with us today as we make every effort to make known the gospel to a lost and dying world. That's what he intends for us to do. And he has promised us that he will be with us always, even to the end of the age. Acts 28 and uh, uh, Acts 28 verse 18. He promised that he would be with us even to the end of the age. And so as we think about that, and then we look a little bit further at some conclusive proof that his activity would be concurrent with the gospel age, even into eternity. And we've just cited Matthew, uh, not Matthew, Acts, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. I'll get it right in a minute. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, when he said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. That must have been wonderful words to those men who are about to set out on a mission, a mission of spreading the gospel to a hostile world. Men who are about to go into the world, as he had commissioned them to do, to go to Jerusalem, and then to Judea, and then to Samaria, and finally to the uttermost parts of the world. Going into a world, much of which is going to be hostile to what they're going to have to say. And yet he promised them, that he, they promised him his presence. B.C. Goodpasture, who's one of the one of our great preachers a generation ago was uh, 
tells a story of one time when he, in his childhood, and he said he and his family lived in the Cumberland Mountains in Middle Tennessee, beautiful country. But he said one night his mother told him to take a bucket or a pail and go to the spring and bring in some water. Back in that part of the country, well, even in some of our parts of the country, at times we had to carry water. We got it from a spring or a pump or a well or somewhere. It didn't have running water in the house anyway. And so she sent him with a bucket to go get a pail of water from the spring. Well, it was dark. As a young boy, good pasture had seen snakes in the, in the path between there and the spring, and so uh, he was frightened. But his dad noticed his apprehension about that, so he got another pail, and he said, Come on, son, we'll get two buckets, and he went with him, and his apprehension vanished. And he felt comfortable in doing that. He raced the trepidations that he had on as a, a child and thinking about those snakes and he and he's thinking was well, my father will be with me and so I'll be safe. Now isn't that the way that we feel with our father, our heavenly father, when we know that he is with us, we know that whatever lurks, whatever whatever hidden things there may be, whatever hostilities we may face, whatever difficulties we may come across, that our heavenly father is there and that he is with us, and he and his son are going to protect us in that way. And so that precious promise continues in his ongoing work. And so as we preach the gospel, though we may run into opposition, there may be difficult times, there may be hostility that we'll face, we know that if we're preaching the truth, and if we're carrying the true gospel to a lost world, that the Lord is going to be with us and he's going to work with us in accomplishing that. I'm not talking just about preachers. I'm talking about we as Christians who have that responsibility to, to take the gospel to the world. Now, it's true that the Great Commission was given to the apostles, but in telling them to teach, to observe the things that they were commanded, we know that it also then becomes our responsibility. Not that we all have the responsibility to stand here in a pulpit like this, but we all have a responsibility to make known the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we carry out that responsibility, we can be assured that Christ will be with us. In Acts 2 and verse 47, as we cited this morning, the Bible says that the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. That word Lord occurs 110 times in Acts and 75% of the time it refers to Christ. Every time a soul is saved, he adds that saved soul to the church. And he would add you today, if you're one of those who is not yet saved, he would add you to the church this day if you were obedient to the gospel, as we mentioned, as we talked about this morning. And he continuously reigns, <coughs> he continuously reigns at, the, at the Father's right hand. Acts 22 and verse 33 Acts 2, verse 33. Uh, Peter said that he's exalted to the right hand of God. Chapter 7 and verse 56, as Stephen is stoned, and as he looks uh, into heaven, he says that he saw the, the Son of God standing at the, at the right hand of God. It's Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 that we've already cited. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses uh, 24 to 28, where Paul is talking there primarily about resurrection. But in verse 20 to 28, he says, Now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man death comes death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ Jesus all will be, will be made alive. But each of his, in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom of God to the to, to the kingdom to the God and Father when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. And so again we see that God is in control. There is the, uh, the idea of intercession. He intercedes for us. Romans 8 verse 34, Christ Jesus is he who died, yes rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, he always lives to make intercession for us. And he continues to be 
our advocate, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He represents our case in the court of heaven. He stands as our advocate to, to be the go-between, the intercessor, the intermediary between us and God as we separate ourselves from God by sin. What better advocate could there be? God and man. That representation is on the merits of his blood. Not on the merits of what we do, but on the merits of his blood. You know, when we look for an attorney, when we have a difficult something difficult, have to go to court, we need an attorney, we look at their credentials. And we look not only at their diplomas and other things that uh, in the way of education, but we look also at their reputation. And we look at some of the things that they have done and some of the people that they represented, and we, we take a good hard look at their, represent, at their uh, credentials before we go and hire them to be our advocate. Well, when we look at the Lord, Jesus Christ, we know that we have the greatest advocate that we can find because he gave his blood for us. Uh, his advocacy is based on his blood. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and his blood cleanses us from all sin, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. So it's important that we understand that. He is ever our mediator. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, there's one God and one mediator between uh, the man, Jesus Christ. Now many may intercede, but only Jesus can mediate. He stands up. Un uniquely between God and man. Well, there are many other things that he continues to do or will do. He'll come again. He'll raise the dead. He'll execute judgment. All of those things are future and yet to come. In Revelation chapter 7, verses 16 and 17, he said that he feeds his people and he leads them to living fountains of water. Revelation chapter 7, verses 16 and 17. They will hunger no more, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of waters of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. And, of course, you read in Revelation chapter 22, 21 and 22, about the beauties of heaven, about the beauties of the the uh, complete cleansed church in eternity, and the the trees on either side of the river bearing fruit, well, bearing all kinds of fruit, the waters, the living waters, and so on. So his work is finished on earth, but his work continues until life ends. Now the question is, what has he done for you? Well, he gave his life for you. That part is finished. But what does he do for you now? And that's dependent upon you. That depends on how we serve. That depends on how we obey. That depends on where we place him in our lives. Where is he in your life? Have you obeyed him? Are you serving him? Is the question as we stand together and sing the song of invitation.